Hello everybody and welcome to Advanced Exposure Techniques Masterclass with the Kinefinity Mavo LF. With me today is Jörn van der Beul, better known to you as Jerome Kinefinity Amsterdam or recently Jerome Gafbagir. Uh, Jerome will help me in this stream to underline the theory with some practical examples. I also want to shout out to Lee Underwood who is a young cinematographer here in Berlin, who actually did all the, the tedious work to find the, some of the information we will show today and who spent a lot of, uh, a lot of time uh, running through all the different settings of the camera and uh, analyzing footage to find these results. All right, so when you expose the camera, uh, you go through your checklist. First, what kind of amount of, uh, what amount and what kind of light do you have available? How do you want to distribute your dynamic range? Uh, in what ways can you control the exposure, um, aperture, shutter speed, and these filters, etc.? And what effect do I want to create? For example, do I want to have the shallow depth of field and uh, have the iris wide open? Let's first have a look at the program for today. So first, we're going to talk about the ISO mode in Kinefinity cameras. We're going to talk about the dual ISO sweet spot. And next, we're going to explore the highlight stop settings, which is a custom dynamic range distribution. Following that, we're going to talk about the EI mode and compare the EI with the ISO mode. And finally, we're gonna talk about the ETTL mode, the exposed to the left mode. All right, let's jump right in. What is ISO? It's an abbreviation for International Standards Organization. It's a value which shows in your cameras with 200, 250 and so on. A certain given ISO is your base ISO plus or minus analog gain. So this is really important. Uh, remember analog gain in ISO mode. And uh, the ISO is a constant, it's valid in and of itself, and therefore we can say it's a true sensitivity. Now, how does it work? In the camera, you choose your sensitivity, your ISO value, then the camera adds or reduces high quality analog gain to the base ISO, and then your chosen ISO is recorded. In a separate step, which you can do, but you don't have to, you can select the dynamic range distribution, which is called the highlight stop settings and that will also influence your image and we will talk more about this in a second so since the Mavo LF and the Terra 4K as well they're both dual ISO cameras which means they have two native ISOs uh, one is 800 the other one is 5120 for the Mavo LF and the base ISO of 800 of course is the one with the best balance between the amount of noise and the, the quality of the image depth of color and so on uh, the 5000 ISO has slightly more noise, but still less noise than 800 plus gain. All right, now, with, since we have these two ISOs, at some point between the two, there will be an, a border uh, where it shifts from one ISO base to, to the next uh, base ISO. And in this example, the border is between 1280 and 1600, which means that 1280 in this case would be 800 plus added gain. Whereas 1600, which is actually the higher ISO, is 5000 base minus gain. So in one case, we have added gain. In the other case, we have negative gain. And that's why you can have an image with a actually higher ISO of 1600 in this case, but which has less noise than the lower ISO of ISO 1280. Now let's I'll give it over to Jerome, who will show you some examples uh, of what we just talked about. If we talk about exposure, I think the first thing we have to tackle is to get a better understanding of what dynamic range is. To get a better dynamic range establishment, I found Cinema 5D to do a lot of uh, dynamic range tests on popular cameras. So what we see here is a recent test of a dynamic range test uh, executed by Cinema 5D. It's called the EMA test and it's with a new uh, Canon C300, which according to me, as a kind of a similar uh, dynamic range as the Mavo LF. So fun thing here, uh, we call, uh, if we check all the patches of dynamic range, we get 16 in total. But uh, a normal professional would only rate this camera for 13.1 stop. That's the one thing you see on the right side. Uh, it says patch range 0.5. That's basically a signal to noise ratio. So the shadow stops of the camera uh, tend to have a lot of noise. Uh, the darker you expose them, the, the less information they will show. And in the end, you only see noise. There's no texture to be resolved. In. So some cameras do uh, internal noise reduction and some uh, cameras don't do internal noise reduction. But my, the point I want to prove here 
is that a camera only has kind of reusable range. So maybe the best camera everyone knows is the Arri Alexa, which has 14, and the Mavo 11 is to be believed around 13 stops. So that's very decent. So if we get a better understanding of that, uh, we go to the next slide. This is a very important part. This is the input of a sensor. So the input of a sensor is, of course, the, the light which enters the lens. So in this example, you see around 14 stops of light. I think that's the average exposure range a normal daylight scene has. And I uh, draw the key light, which is the sun, uh, far away right. Maybe that's the 18th stop or something. So what you see here is, is a normal dynamic range with just a lot of contrast. Uh, it's not an overcast day. There's just a lot of contrast. So there are deep shadows and there are very high highlights in the, in the clouds and in reflections on buildings, etc. So we can change this input, which, um, which enters the lens by, of course, adding neutral density filters, which are called uh, NDs. We can change the aperture or we can change the shutter time of the camera. So now there is the sensor back again. So what we see here is the MAVA left sensor and I call those three lower uh, stops, I call them the swamp. That means that the deeper you go in there, the more uh, mud you enter and the harder it will to resolve a decent picture. So you want to stay out of that swamp. So the sensor sensitivity can be changed by uh, ISO. That's the only thing you can do, of course. I named uh, shutter time before, but I will now just use shutter time as something you can uh, work with during the input of the sensor. And the sensor itself, we only work with the ISO, which is what Michelle expressed as analog gain. So now we go to the next slide. That's the representation output. We can, uh, after we have uh, captured the image, we can represent that. So we can push the image digitally. We can either do that in DaVinci Resolve for any program, or we can do that by camera. So uh, we will later, uh, of course, talk about that more, and uh, uh, Michelle will have a lot of examples about that. So we can alter the log curve, or we can uh, use uh, lookup tables, LUTs, to push the image, to represent it in a different way that it was captured, so we can anticipate on it. We can maybe see the image is now brighter than it was before. So maybe we have to reduce the amount of light hitting the sensor. So that's what we later are going to call shifting the midtone over the dynamic range. So. Um, I think it's now time to um, show some examples. So we have two native ISOs built in, in this camera. We have 800 ISO, we have 5,120. So if we go quickly through this video, we see first uh, in this video, we see ISO 1600, which is basically a push. It's a, uh, not a digital, but an analog push of the sensor. So it will, reduce, uh, it will improve, uh, of course, the light sensitivity of the sensor. But will also um, uh, you also get a lot of noise into the shadow. So so the fun thing is if you use 1600, that's basically a pool of the 5120, which is a, the second base ISO. So you would uh, you would suggest that uh, the 1600 ISO would have more noise than uh, the 1280, but in this case, um, 1600 seems to be a little bit better uh, for the shadow. So here we are in DaVinci Resolve. Let me put it on full screen and let me do a small recap of what we just said before about uh, border ISOs. The Mavo LF sports a dual native gain ISO sensor with 800 ISO being the first native, uh, native gain uh, ISO setting and the 5020 being the second native ISO. So counterintuitively, you would say that 1600 would be um, more noisy than 1280 while that's not the case because uh, 1600 is a pull down from the second native iso and 1280 is a push and pulling is always um, better in that regard than pushing so let's see how this applies to the first native iso uh, what happens when we pull from 800 iso in this case i have made five samples um, at different ISO settings below 800, with the first being 800 ISO, second one 650, third one 500, fourth one 400, and the last one 250. And I exposure compensated with my shutter time to give them all the same expo exposure. So they all yield the same brightness values. The thing I want to explain to you is that you don't have to be scared to use different um, ISO settings uh, below 800. 250 will yield around the same image quality as 800 ISO, where 250 is a little bit cleaner in the shadows. 
but has a little bit less DR in the highlights and 800 is a little bit more noisy, but will have more um, dynamic range in the highlights. And you can easily compensate for those factors by just simply underexposing a little bit for 250 and overexposing a little bit for 800. But again, those differences are really subtle. Um, I made these samples with ID to bottleneck the sensor. So the differences between the brightest part and the darkest part of the um, of the image is measured by a Siconic digital master spot meter of uh, around 13 stops. So the left upper corner is the brightest part and the darkest part of the image uh, are the shadows in the hair. Um, so it's always the best if you want to compare those different settings of a camera by feeding the camera with a very high dynamic range image. So you are basically bottlenecking the sensor. So I hope this helps to understand that you don't have to be scared to use different ISO modes, especially a pull down from the first native ISO. Let's get over to Michelle. The next point is uh, we're gonna talk about the Kinefinity's highlight stop setting. First thing you need to know is it's only available in the ISO mode. It will define how many stops of dynamic range above uh, you have available above middle gray before the details clip in the highlights. So from 3.6 to 5.6 stops, you can adjust. It. And whatever is left in terms of the total dynamic range is going to be used for the shadow. So it does not change even if the ISO changes. So the, the highlight stop setting you set will remain even if you change the ISO, as long as you are in ISO mode. And then the noise level and the quality in the shadows will change depending on the ISO and the highlight stops choices. Okay, so the result of your noise level and quality in your shadows is the, is the combination of these two settings, ISO and highlight stops. And what's important to know is that the ISO border will shift according to different highlight stop settings. Here we have a graphic of, so this is your total dynamic range and for the different ISO. Now we change the highlight stops 4.3, 5.0, and I go back and you see the, the total dynamic range will, will be shifted above or below 18% middle gray. And then you can see on the bottom here, the base ISO, the borders between the two will also shift. See at 3.6 highlight stops, we have the border between the two base ISOs is between 800 and 1000. As we go up, this will shift. Now it's 1200, 1600 and then 2000, 2500, and so on. So that's very important to understand because you could be in highlight stop 4.3 at ISO 1600, which is a great place to be in. But then imagine you change the highlight stops for, for whatever reason, and suddenly you find yourself at base ISO 800 plus added gain instead of 5000 minus gain. So that's important to understand and to know and with that, we're going to go back to Jerome for some examples. I want to go first back to my slide before we uh, go to some uh, examples. So if we look at three new principles, we first uh, spoke about the input, which is basically uh, the lens or the light that enters the sensor. Then if we go to the second, I, I hope you can see my pointer. Uh, if you go to the second bar of uh, patches, you see the sensor. So in this case, this, this part of the input, so the scene, will be clipped because it's outside the range of, of the sensor. Same goes for this, and the sun is maybe six stops over. But the good news is that the, the blacks are in the safe zone. They're outside the swamp. So if we go to, to the output, then basically uh, it will do exactly the same as what the sensor does because, there, because there's no digital gain applied. That's normal in ISO mode. But if we go to... Um, the ISO, or the ISO plus high highlight stops mode, we see the input again, and we go to the sensor, which has 4.3 highlight stops, which is basically the default setting, I would say. So if you don't do anything, or you go back to a factory reset in your camera, it will be at 4.3, which is, according to me, is a, is a very good balanced value. So if you don't know what you're doing, 4.3 would be the, the right value to, uh, to dial in on your camera. So in this case, the sensor uh, is set to uh, highlight stop 4.3. So this patch outside, which entering the light will be clipped on the sensor. 
but the output, the, so the display uh, of the sensor, so your viewfinder or your, your monitor will display around the same thing as the sensor. But now if we go to highlight stop 5.3, so that's one increased stop of light in the highlights. So to get a little bit of an idea how the camera does that for you, we go back to the input. Input remains completely the same, but somehow the, this patch, which was first one stop overexposed, is now inside the limits of the sensor. So that's good news. But on the other hand, the shadow patch is now hitting the, 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 the swamp. Still probably met with some noise reduction, you can still get away with. So we are at 800 ISO on our camera, and we think we are on 800 ISO, but behind the scenes, the camera is adjusting its sensor gain to 400 ISO. So by doing that, it will kind of push the image back, because if you go back from 800 to 400, that's one stop of light. So one stop of light, which is reduced, which makes the sensor less sensitive to light. So that's the reason this last patch of light is now not clipped anymore. So, but the, the issue uh, with this, it's kind of a hard thing to, to, uh, to understand. But the issue with this, if you go back to 400 ISO, is that the whole image will appear dark. So what the camera will do, it will do it digitally by altering the log curve. So it will push this image digitally back to normal. So your midtones uh, will look exactly the same as in 4.3 uh, highlight stop, uh, but you uh, gained one stop of light. But that's of course not completely true. There's no free lunch because we are now still pushing this. We only push it up digitally, but it's still the same input. So it's still as noisy as before. The only thing is that we now uh, get a clear image and we basically rate our sensor in a different way. So now I will go quickly into uh, the Vinci Resolve. So here we are back in Resolve. Um, let's have a look at those highlight stops, but not before I bring you this disclaimer, because I myself don't use the highlight stop setting in Kinefinity cameras. I keep it at a default in this case in the Mava 11 at 4.3. But if you are into experimenting like I like a lot to do, then maybe this tutorial is something for you. So let's put it at 4.3 and then increase it to 5.3. Now in this case, you would basically uh, retain a little bit more highlights in the clouds. Um, uh, it's a little bit of a bad example because at 4.3 setting, it was already pretty much retained. But let's imagine that we need to set the camera for some whatever reason at 5.3. So like I told you before, um, ISO mode setting is kind of a trick. It's a, it's a camera manufacturing trick uh, to map more um, um, stops to the camera without changing its sensitivity. So opposed to when you just simply would change the ISO uh, or change your exposure to um, expose more for the highlights. So to get your exposure down so that all highlights uh, are retained the camera keeps its uh, sensitivity the same, but just simply um, gets more um, highlight retention. So how does the camera do this? It's very simple. Let's set the ISO mode highlight stop setting to 5.3. Let's demystify what the camera is actually doing uh, when increasing this highlight stop setting. So as we can see, when the camera is set to highlight stop setting 5.3, the image has the same brightness as an image set to 4.3, but has one more stop highlights retained at the cost of the shadows. So the camera is basically doing a little bit of a trick to achieve this increased amount of highlight stops. In this case, the ISO is set to 400 analog gain. So the image will appear one stop darker, which basically means that also one more stop of highlights are being retained. Um, you can see this clearly at this image where I just simply put the camera at 400 ISO with a highlight stop setting set to 4.3 and just underexposed it by one stop. So basically this has exactly the same uh, aperture shutter speed settings as this image um, and basically this image is exactly the same as this image. The only difference is that the camera is pushing it back to the 800 ISO brightness digitally. So let me do it just by uh, some post-production, just increase the 
offset a little bit and increase some uh, contrast. Of course, it's not 100% matched because I didn't do my best. But if I, if you would give me 10 more seconds, I would be able to get those images exactly the same. So to round up and to sum up, this is what the camera is doing. If the ISO uh, mode is set to 5.3 highlight stops, it will pull down on the sensor by one stop because that's the difference between 5.3 and the default setting 4.3 and it will push back the image digitally to the normal 800 uh, brightness. So this is without the digital gain applied by the camera and this is with. Next up we're going to talk about the EI mode. What does the EI stand for? It means exposure index and it's uh, actually the same thing as the ISO. It's also the camera sensitivity. Uh, the difference is that in EI mode, the camera takes the base ISO plus or minus a digital gain. And in the Kinefinity, in, in the Marvo LF and in other Kinefinity cameras, the analog gain, which we have in ISO, is actually of a higher quality than the digital gain. But the idea of the EI mode is not to be recorded when you are in RAW. So the principle of the EI mode actually only makes sense if you if you shoot in, in RAW, this is what I would say. And since the EI mode is depending on other values, we call it a, an effective sensitivity. And it's important to note that in the EI mode, the border between the two base ISOs is fixed at 2000 and 2560. So how does it work? Well, you choose your EI sensitivity and then two things will happen at the same time. One is, like we just said, the camera will add or re remove the digital gain to the base ISO. And at the same time, the dynamic range distribution, so the highlight stops, will change depending on the EI value which you choose. And we can see this here in our chart. You can see on the bottom the the EI value, which is also expressed in the same increments as the ISO. And as you can see, as we go up for each base ISO, the highlight stops distribution, the dynamic range distribution will also shift up or down. And this is also one of the reasons why the manufacturer recommends not to use the, the EI mode when you're shooting in one of the compressed codecs, because then that digital gain will be baked into your footage. And then here again, I will give over to Jerome, who will show you more examples of this. I'm going to take the same approach on this. We go back to my uh, slides. So we are now in EI mode. Again, we explained this principle about the input, which is the light that enters the, the, the lens and then is being projected onto the sensor. And then we have the sensor itself which is priced there is best to capture the input. So in this case, the sensor is set at 800 ISO, which is the native gain. And the EI is also 800 ISO. Just please remember that whatever value will dial in, but also only if you go to a very high value, it will switch to the dual native ISO, so to the second native ISO, which is 5,020. But as Michel explained, first, if we go to big numbers like 2,000, we still are stick to the 800 ISO. So the EI only displays the negative or the, the, the digital gain while the sensor uh, remains on its native gain. So in this case, because the EI is set to 800, the output is exactly the same as what the sensor can. But let's to go to the second uh, slide. So if you are in EI mode and we set our uh, ISO to 1600, so it's still at 800 native gain, then basically the sensor still captures the exact same image as uh, before, exactly the same. This patch will still uh, be pushed outside the range of the, the sensor, so it will still be badly clipped and the output is different. So that's the fun thing. So the sensor will still capture exactly the same data, but the processor inside the camera will then digitally push that image that's being captured closer to a higher brightness. So it will it will push the midtones up. So this patch will now be here. So it will be have more luminance, a higher, we would say, a higher ear eyelid. So in this case, you would say, why do you want that? Because you still have the exact same range, but this is all about dis displaying. It's all about representing the, um, the information your camera is captured. So to get a better idea, please remember what we did here. Input remains the same, but we go to our next slide. Now, all of a sudden, we changed our input. So we did that in this case by adding an uh, ND filter. 
So we reduce the light that's entering the lens and uh, projecting onto the sensor by one stop. So we are still at 800 ISO. We are still outputting this image uh, with one stop digitally pushed. But all of a sudden, this image is now back to the luminance, back to where we were at 800 ISO. So that's what Michel is mentioning when he's saying you're shifting the midtones over the sensor. Basically, not the camera is doing that, but you are doing that. That's the, that's the, that's the fun thing. Um, the camera is only representing this, um, this captured data in a higher luminance. Um, then you are anticipating like, oh, this is way too bright. So you close your aperture or you put some ND filters and then all of a sudden this part is not clipped anymore. Um, the whole mapping of the scene is different. So you gain more highlights because this stop was first here. And now everything, this whole patch of uh, luminance is shifted one stop to the left. So we created more highlights, so not by altering our sensor, but we did it all by ourselves by reducing the amount of light entering the camera by uh, minus one. The fun thing about this is that you can also do this by using LUTs, a uh, lookup table. Uh, as Michel mentioned, the downside of doing this is that the camera is uh, baking in this digital gain, which not really improves the quality of the image. It will do, just do something you can do yourself also in post. So if you shoot raw on this camera, it won't bake in the CDI. You will only work as a lookup table. And uh, if you're in uh, back in post, the image will appear dark. So that's that's my slide. So we are back in Resolve with an example of what CDI is. So I'm not gonna show you footage shot with CDI but I'm gonna replicate the Cine EI effect inside DaVinci Resolve so you get a better understanding of what the camera is actually doing and why it's not so hard to understand. So we have um, one, two, three, four images here. So for instance, this is 800 ISO. And remember that Cine EI is always setting the uh, sensor analog gain to its native, so in this case 800. So it's not increasing the analog gain. So the behavior of the uh, sensor is um, always the same. The only thing which changes is the digital gain. Digital gain is a value which is something you can do in post or you can do during the recording. In the case of CineEI, the digital gain is baked in. So if we look at the first image, nothing is happening. There's no digital gain applied. In this case, this would be ISO uh, 1600, CineEI 1600. So this is how it would look like if you would just simply um, shoot at 800, find out that, uh, let's go to the right uh, hand corner, find out that your highlights are clipped, um, and then you put like a LUT on there, and you will think, hey, this is kind of a normal brightness uh, for the skin tones, so I would be scared to underexpose this to save my highlights. So then you go into uh, the 1600 CineEI version and it would look like this. So then you go into the 1600 and you'll find out, hey, the shadows, they still look pretty good. There's still no, uh, not that much uh, noise happening. So there, and there's also all the details are retained. And if you look at the scope right um, down corner, you will still you will see that now all uh, the highlights are retained. So we have a lot of uh, information in the highlights to play with in post. While on the left, you we clip them and we throw them away. So the second version of exposure is better. And why are we retaining our highlights? Not because of CineEI, but because of our behavior. We look at a brighter image uh, with 1600 ASA because of the digital uh, um, altering of the log curve, so then we take down our exposure to uh, have a normal exposure for, like in this case, the skin tones. So another example, uh, 3200 uh, CineEI looks like this. Let me, so this is the thing which the camera does. So normally, if you put your camera at 800 ISO and you underexpose by two stops, the log will the log image will look, that, look like this and if you put like a LUT the standard Kina neutral LUT on there everyone on the set will just scream out loud like hey shit we have a problem this is uh, gonna look dramatically underexposed and we cannot use this footage so in this case I wouldn't recommend to shoot uh, CineEI uh, 3200 because we already saw on the previous version with the normal exposure uh, that all highlights were retained, so I would never suggest to yeah, to to retain 
uh, more highlights if we uh, look at the image uh, 3200 so basically two stops underexposed i show you now what the camera is doing we'll push the image digitally back to normal so the dup will get a similar image um, like he saw in this viewfinder when he was shooting 800 iso so then everyone on the set will judge that this image is still great there's still quite a lot of um, dynamic range in the shadows not too much noise so this image is still uh, retained uh, retained pretty good so um, but if we go three stops under let me quickly disable um, this then we already see that's a little bit a weird shot and if you look closely there's a lot of noise especially those crt like fixed pattern noise scanning lines if we put like a lot on there it looks pretty awful maybe with a lot of uh, neat video uh, post-production um, tools i can maybe uh, reduce the amount of noise but still there's also a lot of uh, yeah decreased amount of um, range in the shadows and again it's not necessary to do this because we already saw that with one stop uh, under uh, the 1600 ei version we already retained all of the information inside this shot so don't so i would never recommend to go further than um, the moment that you see that all your um, highlights are retained so now put a creative lot on there so you can see a little bit this is uh three stops under with a lot of uh yeah post-production uh, effects like uh neat video noise reduction and you can see that the, um, uh, the image um, uh, three stops under is still pretty good um, still pretty good i would say but yeah not necessary to go to the extremes because already on um, the second shot all my highlights are retained look at the wave scope look at the difference between shot one and two so this is what i wanted to explain about exposure i think everyone uh, will get a good idea now what scene ei is all right next up ettl monitoring like we just said is an alternative way to control the dynamic range distribution so again ettl means exposed to the left and you choose to purposefully underexpose your image and therefore you have more range in the highlights it is similar to raising the highlight stops value but maybe without certain disadvantages which again we're going to see in a moment it uses the camera's sweet spot which is not to be confused with the base iso a sweet spot is something subjective which is determined by the user the manufacturer can also say what a certain sweet spot is which generally is the base iso but in this case we talk about the subjective sweet spot as it's chosen by the by the user and as we saw we use a special lookup tables to help you with exposure and to assist you later in post but other than that those lookup tables have no direct effect on the image which you capture and the whole goal of this is to have noise level and qualities in the shadows which is of a better quality depending on which ettl level you choose so we can say it's an approach with extra steps but which may have some great results now how does it work so you set your camera to your chosen sweet spot which in this case we say it's 800 at highlight stop 4.3 so that's base 800 minus analog gain and then you choose your ettl lot so before you put on the lookup table your image is exposed normally then as you put on the ettl lot it will be overexposed by one stop two stops three stops and then you have to manually counteract this overexposure by closing down the eye rays or adding ND, which will result in an image in the end, which is underexposed, one stop, two stop, three stops. And then in post, you can simply use that same lookup table, which is always included in the folder of your footage clip. And then you can simply apply those lookup tables to see the image as you saw it on set. Now here we have the chart of the ETTL and you can see that we start with ETTL zero, which is just kin and newt M. And then as we increase the ETTL plus one, plus two, plus three, the amount of highlights which you have above middle gray also increases. And what is to be noted here is that we have with ETTL plus three, we have a value of 7.3 stops above middle gray which is almost two stops above what you can even achieve with the highlight stops value. So, all right, I give it back to Jerome for ETTL examples. So again, dynamic range. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings here. It's something which is uh, used a lot by brands to market their cameras. 
Nowadays, a free camera which comes out will be 14 or 15 or maybe 16 stops. I even see red cameras coming in at 16 and a half stop. So, of course, it's very important for a cinematographer to have a lot of uh, dynamic range available. And you need dynamic range for uh, two general reasons. Reason one, to avoid mistakes, because if you have a low DR camera, which has a very low dynamic range, chances are pretty high that you will expose the image in such a way that you will lose very precious details, like the clouds, maybe skin tones, will, which will be overly noised or whatsoever. So the important thing to remember is that the dynamic range is a friend of the, uh, the cinematographer. And every cinematographer demands at least 40 stops. And there's maybe only one camera which can do that. And I think the Mavo LF is very close to that camera. But the only difference between those two cameras is that that very expensive German camera uh, gives the director of photography a little bit more room for error. So that means that if you expose wrongly or you made a mistake, wasn't sure at what stop you had to set your camera, then there will be still enough information retained both on the shadow side and the highlight side to still give a decent image to your grader and make some magic out. With the Mavo LF, I'm still convinced you can get exactly the same images as with the other cameras. And that's why we speak about exposure this whole masterclass long, because it's such an important thing to represent the information on your display while shooting a movie or a commercial in such a way that the director of photography feels confident that still the shadow uh, tones are rendered in such a way that there's still enough information for the post-production and the highlight stops are still retained. So the image doesn't look that much video-ish. So as we've uh, spoken before about dynamic range on the right side, on the on the highlight side, there's a brick wall. Everything which is going to clip is going to clip hard. So the highlight roll off in a camera is something a lot of people are talking about, but it's something you do in a lot, which has a little bit more uh, highlight roll off. And the more dynamic range a camera has, the more highlight roll off you can, uh, the more luxury you have to push your highlight slowly to that clipping point. So you don't see that tech hard line between where still image retained and where the image is completely gone and blown out. So if you go back to that, I think ETTL is the most simplest way and the most easiest way to map your dynamic range in such a way that everything is retained. Like I said before, a normal dynamic range, uh, if you shoot outside, even with a harsh sun out, that is around 12 stops, maybe 13 stops. But there's also a lot of myth going on. Because if you have the sun in your shot, so you're framing the sun within your shot, then even on the most expensive high dynamic range cameras, you will never get texture inside that sun. You will have to underexpose by eight or nine stops. So in a normal dynamic range context and an outside scene, there is around 30 stops to capture. Maybe sometimes 40 stops, but then we talk about reflective light, which you can then reduce by using Polaroid filters and such. So back to Resolve and to the last chapter called ETTL, Exposure to the Left. Um, it's a technique I use myself uh, exclusively and uh, I've made a few LUTs. For me, uh, this uh, technique makes a lot of sense and destroy basically the need to use either uh, EI or uh, the highlight stop setting. So in this case, we've put the camera on 800 ISO, 4.3 highlight stops, which is the default setting. There's no way you can really disable it in the camera, but at 4.3, it's kind of disabled. So um, let me talk you through rating your camera. So 800 ISO is a number Kinefinity came up with. Um, and they came, and the only way you can really put that number on there is by putting a lot and then measure the IRE levels of, for instance, mid-gray, and then you can link that to a certain ISO number. So let's put the Kinefinity LUT on there. So this is the LUT the camera ships with. It's called the Kina Neutral LUT, and the exposure looks pretty normal. Of course, not the best looking image. Um, I use, uh, for this case, I used a little bit of uh, vintage lenses which have a little bit low in contrast and have a little bit of a green shade, but uh, you can easily uh, compensate for that. But other than that, this is a normal exposed image um, if you would um, monitor it with this LUT. But what if this LUT would look like this? In this case, the image looks fairly overexposed and you still see that there's 
not that much noise in the shadows. Maybe I can show this a little bit, showcase this a little bit better by going full screen. This image looks very clean, but overexposed. Um, so in this case, I would say the camera is rated at 1600 ISO. Um, and we uh, would take down the exposure of the camera by maybe one stop. So let's take the camera's exposure. Let's copy this. Um, let's copy this uh, kind of uh, LUT and let's underexpose the camera by at least one stop. So now the camera, as you can see, is one stop underexposed, and I applied the same settings to the clip, uh, to this, uh, to the to this clip as to the first clip, and the exposure looks a hell lot better. So this is uh, how ETTL works. You rate your camera differently. So in this case, I rate my camera 1600 ISO. I put a LUT on there, which uh, showcases the image or represents the log uh, footage, uh, the log curve in a much more brighter way by pushing up the midtones. And therefore I um, myself as a DOP have to compensate for the uh, increased uh, brightness by reducing the exposure. Uh, I do that either by aperture or ND filters or shutter time. And this is exactly how ETTL works. You basically underexpose the sensor, but by adding a LUT, you can uh, confidently uh, um, still monitor your shadows because they are not crushed. And you can see whether or not they uh, yield still enough um, quality, or, uh, I would say, uh, good amounts of uh, textures without too much added noise. So this is how ETTL works. I prefer ETTL 1. That's uh, uh, a better balance for me um, than the Kine Neutral LUT. And by using this LUT, you will notice that you will underexpose your footage by one stop. And in post, you can just simply push it back. It's basically the same procedure as highlight stop setting. But in this case, you know exactly what you're doing. And you can simply, uh, by going inside the LUT menu, toggle through these different LUTs and see how the camera is behaving and how the highlight stops uh, are retained and how the shadow stops still look good. And then you can choose your best exposure setting. So this is how ETTL works. Back to Michel. All right, to conclude, I would like to say that the most important takeaway from all of this is that the cinematographer has to test his camera thoroughly in order to A, find the settings which work best for him or her, and B, know which settings or combinations of settings to avoid. From our camera test, we found charts like this one here, which may serve as a guideline for where to find the best ISO settings relative to the highlight stop settings and which ones to avoid. Here is an alternative chart from a fellow Kinefinity user, which is visually more appealing, but depicts the same thing. But no matter what's the solution you go for in the end, whether it's EI mode or ISO mode or the promising ETTL mode. We encourage you to make your own tests and draw up your own charts so that you can be more self-sufficient in your upcoming projects. All right, and that concludes our masterclass for today. I hope you had as much fun as we did. Feel free to contact us if you have any questions. Thanks for watching and see you next time.